Hey, everybody, and welcome back to NetDevOps Live. We're here on episode three in season three, and joining me is Samir from IntentionNet to talk to us about Batfish, a network validation and health check system that I personally think has got a lot of magic under the hood, and I'm looking forward to learning more about kind of how this tool works and how we can fit it into our use cases. As always with the sessions, if you have questions during the event, please use the question panel in the webinar. I'll be watching them throughout the talk and gathering up all the questions. And then we'll have a good chunk of time at the end for a little bit of dialogue so that we can kind of pose all of these questions and get the answers from Samir. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to you and take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Hank. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, it's a great opportunity to share more about what we're doing and what Batfish is all about. A little quick intro about myself. I'm Samir Parikh. I'm the head of product at IntentionNet. And we are the company that is behind Batfish, uh, the open source project, as well as sort of our commercial offering, which is Batfish Enterprise. So without further ado, why don't I sort of dive into my presentation and uh, let's talk more about Batfish. All right, so as Hank's aptly titled, we're gonna fish for network health with Batfish. Uh, just a little bit of background about us. I promise I'll keep it the minimal. IntentionNet, we are a Seattle-based uh, ventures-backed startup and our mission is to help you eliminate network outages and breaches. That is uh, what, what we're spending our time on. That's what the product we're building does. A little bit about what we're building. The product we're building is called Batfish. So the genesis of Batfish is actually started as a research project uh, back in 2012, funded by Microsoft Research. And the whole question they wanted to answer was, can you validate changes to your network before you make them? So we have robust tools to do verification and validation for software solutions, for hardware solutions. But can you take that same concept and apply it to networking? Uh, obviously, you know, in the advent of cloud computing and their investment in Azure is a very relevant question. So that research started in 2012. In 2014, the first prototype was open sourced under Apache 2. And since then, you know, Batfish has been growing in capabilities. We've been growing with new contributors uh, from not only ourselves at IntentionNet, but uh, Amazon has been contributing and other research universities. And then we've also have deployments at multiple Fortune 500 companies. So we often get the question, why Batfish? And it's, you know, our answer is pretty simple. It's like when we look at the network lifecycle from design to test to deploy to monitor, that testing or sort of the validation phase is the weakest link. Uh, and I think the obvious reason for that is it's really just hard to test your production network. Uh, nobody wants to use production as tests, so that's very dangerous. And then emulation, sort of creating virtual labs or physical labs, doesn't really mimic production scale. Uh, there's been a lot of strides in sort of virtual uh, lab technologies, but it's still not quite there for where you can simulate 100% of your production environment. And that creates sort of this fear of what is going to happen with the next change? Is that going to take my network down? And so the pace of change is very slow. And that's where Batfish comes into play. So our express goal is to have Batfish provide comprehensive pre-deployment validation. So and we're gonna give you a comprehensive view of what happens to the network on the change and help you validate that its behavior is gonna be what you need it to be, what you want it to be. And that means bad changes don't reach the network. And that means you can start making changes rapidly. All right, so how does this work? So Batfish operates as an offline service and it operates on device configurations for your network. And it's multi-vendor, so it supports all the standard pr products you'd expect us to see. Uh, all the different variations of the Cisco products from the iOS products, to iOS XE, to NXOS, to iOS XR, you know, including the ASA firewall family, to Juniper, to Arista, uh, Cumulus white box switches, Palo Alto firewalls, F5 load balancers. But we also go beyond the physical networking world and also understand cloud with AWS. And then we keep adding more and more of these sort of as we get interest from the community in the open source world or from our uh, enterprise customers, we add new products and new technologies into Batfish. So the way this works is Batfish consumes these configurations. So you deposit them into the service using the APIs and it builds a series of network models. And so there's three primary network models that get built uh, by Batfish once it uh, ingests and parses these configs. The first is just a vendor neutral configuration model. So what this allows us to do is normalize uh, the configuration of the device. And so we don't have to worry about the vendor differences. So, you know, simplest example ends up being, you know, in Cisco, an access list, you have an input access list or an output access list. In Juniper, you have an input firewall filter or an output firewall filter. You know, in our model, everything's either an input filter or an output filter, right? 
Same way, you know, in Juniper, you have terms and uh, iOS, you typically have line numbers. So all of that gets normalized in our vendor neutral config model. So it's very easy for us to, uh, to query that model to look at different attributes. The second set of models is sort of you know, are the routing models. And this is where, you know, a lot of energy gets spent when we add platform support in Batfish is we build a vendor and device accurate routing and forwarding simulation and forwarding model. And the way we do that is we understand as we're writing uh, these sort of device parsers and device drivers, the exact way different vendors process routing protocols, for instance. So we know the differences between Cisco iOS BGP and Cisco NXOS BGP and Juniper uh, Junos BGP. What are the default values? What are the uh, what is the sort of best path selection algorithm? What are the rules around route redistribution and propagation, et cetera? So that is all encoded to be vendor specific in our device models. And that allows us to build a vendor, sort of a network faithful or vendor accurate routing and porting simulation based on those configs. And that's the real key thing that allows us to sort of be pr provide pre deployment validation because we build the full forwarding uh, data plane of the network. The third set of models are sort of these mathematical behavior models. And so uh, the reason for these, and again, this is also where a lot of the research has been focused is how do you take this routing table information that you generated, the configs, and figure out what packets are gonna flow through the network and how they're gonna flow through the network. What you don't wanna have to do is generate every single packet and see what happens, right? The, the header combinations, the number of bits, it's just too many. Uh, it's an intractable problem. It's just, can, you'll never finish your simulation. And so this is where a lot of the work happens around converting these models into a series of equations that we can then solve for. And that allows us to easily understand and quickly tell you what packets can flow, what packets won't flow through the network. This all gets married with an analysis engine. And this is sort of a combination of uh, techniques and technologies we've created and also sort of off the shelf uh, constraint solvers uh, that we that are sort of used in other disciplines. And then you interact with these, uh, with, with the Batfish service, through either querying the different data models. So you can query the forwarding model, you can create the routing tables, you can query the configs, uh, or you can also then turn all these queries into policies, uh, which is sort of obviously the, the interesting part of building an automated pipeline and a CICD pipeline is sort of turning network behaviors into policies that you, uh, that you want to enforce at all times. So let's see how that works. So, in Batfish, there's four broad categories of analysis that you can do. So each of these are so that you can look at these as queries and policies. The first one is just sort of what we think of as configuration audit. So things that we've been doing for years with sort of Perl and expect scripts and now Python, where you know you check NTP servers, you check six lock settings, you check MTUs on interfaces, uh, you make sure your devices are compliant to some standard you have <coughs> for your for a particular site or your network wide. But you can also extend that to protocol sessions. So, you know, obviously, in order to do a routing and forwarding simulation, we need to understand what configuration is going to make the BGP session come up versus what is not. Same thing for an IPsec tunnel, same thing for an MLAG or a Cisco port, a virtual port channel. So, all of these session uh, based compatibility checks are also possible uh, just through sort of auditing the config. The second broad category is around security analysis or sort of ACL and firewall analysis. So you can take an access list or a firewall and understand what flows are going to be permitted, what flows are going to be denied. So if you have a list of sensitive services, you can understand how well they are protected or not by that rule, by that access list or firewall. Similarly, you can, when you, you can propose a change and understand the impact of that change. You can understand what's going to be allowed that wasn't, what's going to be denied that wasn't before. The third category is, is sort of the routing and forwarding analysis. So we've built this routing and forwarding simulation. Now we can use that to understand, is the network redundant? So you can propose changes saying, okay, what happens if this node fails? What happens if these links go down? Uh, you can also do ch uh, changes around routing policy. So show me what the impact is of making this prefix list change or this route map change or this community list change in terms of how routes propagate through my network, what routes I accept, what routes I ex export, so especially useful when you're starting to do things on peering points to understand what you're sending to your neighbor, neighboring uh, ASs and what you're receiving from them. And the last category ends up being the broad, broadest category is around sort of reachability analysis. So you have this exhaustive reachability analysis. And this is where those mathematical models really come to play. So you know, you've got 
some secure zone. Let's say you're a financial institution that deals with payments. You've got a PCI zone. You have very strict requirements around how traffic can get into that zone and what traffic is allowed. So you can craft policies around that saying, OK, can any flow get from a public zone to my PCI zone? Or make you can write a rule that says, make sure nothing can get to my PCI zone that doesn't go through this specific firewall or doesn't or that doesn't use this bastion jump host. So you can craft very specific forwarding based policies as well that sort of describes the core network behavior you care about. Similarly, you know, you're running services, you're hosting services that need to be globally accessible. Maybe it's a DNS service inside your network. Maybe it's your, you know, your directory service, your LDAP service that needs to be accessible. You can write a rule that says, hey, make sure everybody in my network can always access this service no matter what change gets done. Uh, or maybe it's an external uh, service for your hosted website for your company. You can write a rule that says, make sure everybody from outside my network can always access this as well. So it gives you a lot of flexibility and a lot of power around defining what is correct behavior for your network and encoding those as policies. And then every time you make a change in an automated world, you can get a report of what those policies are and what's the posture of your network. So this is gonna be like just the last slide. I wanna sort of talk a little bit about how people use Batfish and then let's just we'll just see it in action. So the way organizations typically use Batfish there's three common uh, modes that we are seeing today. One is in the CI CD pipeline, right? This is this is our goal for automation. Is like we want to be able to propose a change, have it be validated, and then if it passes every test that we care about, get automatically deployed. So I can sort of make changes rapidly. So I can evolve the network very fast. And that is sort of where some of our customers are for part of their network. Uh, they also sort of have one data center or two data centers and the newer stuff they've implemented that has an automated pipeline that allows them to do deployment uh, and validation all uh, from the push of a button. The more common mode is because a lot of organizations are working their way towards that CICD pipeline and making those investments is sort of what we call interactive change validation. So you may not have a full pipeline, but you've gotten some level of policy definitions that you understand your network must meet. So you've encoded those. And then you just propose a change in Batfish, and then you look at those policies, but then you also then leverage queries where you sort of, you know, akin to what you would do in your virtual lab is like you make a change, you run a show command, you run a Batfish show command, so to speak, right? You query the Batfish data model saying, you know, I expect this change to have created this route. Let me check to see if this route is there. Or I expect this change to have, you know, blocked this traffic. Let me make sure that traffic's blocked. And you can sort of interactively understand the impact of that change. And so even if you don't have everything enumerated from a policy standpoint, you can start getting value, testing value out of Batfish by just sort of interacting with it, just like you would with uh, you know, your lab network where you run a series of show commands after taking some action. And the third case of, in scenario is really around design. So even before, uh, when people are starting their automation journey, they're building out their Jinja templates and building out their designs, you know, we've had a couple of customers where uh, they were building out a new, a new facility and they started from scratch, built their design pipeline, built their Jinja templates, did their data store, uh, source of truth. And then they used Batfish to validate the entire design before standing up any equipment. They were able to make sure the route propagation they got was what they wanted, the failover characteristics were what they wanted, reachability characteristics were what they wanted. And so through that process, not only were they able to build policies for the network, but they validated the design and this iterative process meant they were ready to go with their CI CD pipeline as soon as the facility was online. All right, so enough talking about sort of slides. Let's sort of just dive into uh, the product in action. And what I wanna do is just sort of set the stage for what the demo is. So in this demo, I'm gonna show you an, a, an automated workflow where I'm gonna author a change and I'm gonna create a PR. So I'm gonna use GitLab as my source control and as my CI system. And then Batfish is going to be uh, the policy evaluation part of the CI system. So GitLab is going to, I'm gonna author a change in my GitLab repo. I'm gonna commit that to a branch. It's gonna trigger my CI pipeline. That's gonna pull all the config artifacts I need from SCM, send those to Batfish for evaluation along with my the Batfish policies. And then those results are gonna be posted back to that uh, merge request in GitLab. So let's dive into that. So what I'm showing you here uh, is the enterprise version. The, the UI is part of our Batfish enterprise offering, not part of the open source. 
But this pipeline example, uh, we have a fully open source version of it on our in our GitHub repo. The links will be attached at the end, so you can use that uh, and follow along as well if you're just playing around with the open source Batfish uh, solution. But the the enterprise version just gives it, makes it a little easier to talk to people through through a demo. So typically, what's going to happen when Batfish first gets a uh, gets a snapshot of network configs, it's going to build the topology. So it's going to understand which devices are connected to which other devices, how are they connected, what are the interfaces, what are the routing protocol sections, et cetera. And so internally, you'll get this nice topology and this diagram of who's connected to whom and how. Uh, and uh, in the enterprise version, you'll see this visual and then you'll see the list of snapshots. So this is just the history of which sort of grouping of configs you sent to Batfish for its analysis. And then the other cool thing, obviously, the goal is the CI pipeline is this notion of policies. So uh, I have this policy evaluation pane. So in my enterprise offering, I can see what's the policy posture of that snapshot. Uh, in this case, everything has passed. And also to just give you a little bit of rundown to, to give you a sense of the type of policies we're talking about. Uh, some of them are we think of basic policies, like make sure there's no undefined references. So make sure you're not referencing a prefix list in a route map when the prefix list doesn't exist. Uh, I don't want any duplicate IPs, so make sure I'm not sort of reusing IP addresses uh, when I'm not supposed to. Check for NTUs, uh, network masks. You can anything you can think of. We want to craft, you know, proxy ARP settings. Uh, these are sort of basic config hygiene policies. I can sort of create routing policies. So some of them are simple. Hey, I've got BGP sessions configured. Make sure all of them are up. Right. Or in my Example of the data center, I'm not using I, e, IBGP. All my BGP pairings are eBGP. So I'm going to write a rule that says, make sure nobody misconfigures a session to be IBGP instead of eBGP. I want to make sure there's no forwarding loops, no duplicate AS numbers. So you know, anything I can think of, you know, I could write a rule around, make sure there's a default route uh, and, that it, and it has X number of next tops. So anything is possible. And then now I've got a couple of categories in terms of that exhaustive reachability analysis. So. I've got a series of reachability policies. So one of them is designed to say, hey, I've got some external resources I want to always access. Let's make sure those are always true. So I use Google DNS as my pr primary DNS externally. Then I use Cloudflare as my backup. Let's make sure I can always access those. Uh, I've got some deployment in AWS with public IPs, or I'm using a public S3 bucket. So I want to get to the AWS services. So make sure those are all reachable. And then within my data center, I want to make sure all leaf pairs are reachable. So uh, I want to make sure that any server behind one of my leafs can talk to any other server behind those leaves. So that sort of encodes what my sort of positive attributes, what are the, the, the reachability policies I care about. But I can also look at some of my security policies. So hey, let me make sure that nobody can access the subnet that I've designed, I've designated as being private, or make sure that there's no way for anybody to query my MySQL database ports from outside my network, or nobody can do remote desktop into my network from outside my network. So these are very, very well-defined security policies that I can write. So, so now let's just trigger the pipeline. So in order to sort of simulate what a common workflow is for our customers, what I've done is so I've got that GitLab repo. I have a local clone here. So I'm just going to make sure it's up to date. It is. And what I've done is I've built a series of Ansible playbooks. Uh, this could be, you could be doing this through Ansible Tower. You could be doing this by directly editing files in, you know, in the GitLab UI. You could do it from a service now trigger where it sort of creates a workflow and then sends configs to Batfish. Whatever is the, uh, the workflow that you want to build for your network. So here I just chose Ansible uh, as a common example. And I built a series, a couple of different uh, playbooks that simulate common changes you would make expect to see in a data center, right? So common changes, you're adding capacity. So you're adding new servers. That means you need to add new leaf and spines potentially. And then the other things that you would probably do is like if you're, it's a multi-tenant data center, you're adding tenants, you're adding endpoints, you're adding applications. So you're going to make some firewall changes. So this first scenario, what I want to share is well, I'm just going to add some capacity. So I'm going to, you know, I have capacity in my spine layer. I'm going to add a new leaf. Uh, and I've just sort of simplified that process by allowing people to just run this playbook and give me two pieces of information. Yep. It's about playbook, not playbooks. 
there we go. So all I need to do is I need to give it the new leaf number, which I know in my case is leaf 90 and a BGPAS number. And so that's all I did. And behind the scenes, my workflow is going to generate the YAML input I need, merge the Jinja templates I've defined to now build my device configurations. And then as soon as those configs are built and the sort of basic linting phase is passed, it's going to send those configs over to Batfish for its evaluation. And we can actually see that in action right here. So there you go. You see this new the snapshot was triggered. Uh, and now, so Batfish is evaluating uh, that config. It's going to build out, again, this new topology once it finishes parsing. And then it's going to evaluate all the policies. So this will just take another uh, few seconds, and then we'll, we'll see the new topology, and then we'll start seeing the policy results come through. There we go. So uh, I've got this new topology. And to prove that it is actually new and generated, I can see that Leaf 90 is here. And if I was to actually go back to the previous snapshot and search for leaf 90, you would not find it. So this just, you know, making sure that, you know, we're not waving any hands. This actually is a new snapshot in Batfish. It's a, a new topology that was built because I added that new leaf. And now I've got my policy posture. So let's go look at that. And so as policies are being evaluated, this page gets updated with the different results. So I can automatically, I, immediately see I've got some failures, so I can dig into that. So let's look at these two tests that have failed. So I have two that have failed. The first one is duplicate my duplicate BGP AS check. And so here I have leaf 90 and 09 using the same AS number, 65009. So clearly I fat fingered that. It should have been uh, my design pattern is the AS number is equal to the leaf ID. And then test for all leaf routers have all host subnets. Now I see that leaf 90 and 09 are missing some subnets, which again makes sense because if every AS number is supposed to be unique, you're not going to configure BGP allow AS in. And so you're going to reject a route where the originating AS is the same as your AS. So in this case, it's a pretty easy uh, test failure. I know exactly what I should change. Uh, everything else passed. So again, in this sort of automated CI CD world, this is what you do. You'd go back and I would just rerun my playbook and just make sure I had the correct input. So go back to leaf 90, 5090, and fix leaf 90 BGP ASN. It's always good to give some commit message that uh, people are gonna be able to understand and we're sort of off and running. So now that's gonna recreate the same workflow. So while we're waiting for that uh, to show up, the other thing that's sort of handy in Batfish is the ability to sort of create this comparison of two snapshots. So, you know, these policies are evaluating what is the behavior of the snapshot. Uh, but for some folks, like especially when I mentioned this notion of interactive change validation, where you may not have well-defined policies for everything, but you need you want to leverage Batfish to understand the impact of changes. Well, this is sort of one thing you can do is, you know, and again, the UI is a nice uh, has a nice way of visualizing this. Uh, you can get a lot of this information from the Python APIs as well by running certain queries differentially. And so I can I see this nice curated view of what are the differences in the snapshot from the reference. So I can see, OK, I added one new file. That file resulted in one new device showing up. Uh, I can look at, let's see, from a routing protocol standpoint, what that did was I had changes in about nine BGP sessions. So I had. Uh, these sessions that can, were not established are now established in one snapshot. I can see the routing table differences. So Batfish has computed the difference in routing tables. I can see, you know, majority of my routers have three new prefixes. Uh, the rest of them are unchanged. And I can even drill into that to understand specifically what those are. So here I see these three subnets. So one's obviously the loopback for Leaf 90. And then again, my IP addressing scheme is, you know, the third octet is the leaf number, and then 100 is an internal subnet, 200 is an external subnet. And the other sort of cool thing that we do, and this is sort of hard to get from just the Python APIs because it's a it's a visual, but again, all the information is there in the data model, so you can query it. But we take what we call the reachability matrix of each snapshot. So you know the list of all the flows that are going to be permitted in a snapshot. 
So we take that, that view from both snapshots and we create a diff for that. And so we visualize for you what has changed from a reachability standpoint. So in this particular case, I can see the only thing that's changed is I've added flows. And the way to sort of think of this is I've got a series of source locations or places where packets can enter uh, my infrastructure and destination locations, places where packets will exit. And I've got a matrix of who can talk to whom. So I can see a couple of different things here. So I have these two VLAN interfaces on Leaf 90 and they clearly have reachability everywhere else. And that makes sense because they're new. And then similarly, I have them as destinations and I see all these other locations are able to access it but with one notable exception. So I look at my internet, so anything originating outside my network can reach some resources on VLAN 290, which is my public uh, uh, VLAN or public IP subnet for that leaf, but not 190, which is my private. So it, even if I didn't, since I didn't encode that necessarily as a policy, but this is sort of a good way for me to understand, okay, yes, this is the correct behavior. So I'm allowing ICMP access from outside my network into my network, uh, for certain subnets, but not all. And I can see that's the case. So, and I can drill into this. So if I say, okay, just show me the internet as a source and show me what's changed. You can see that the only thing that's changed is access to VLAN 290. The other cool thing that we sort of can do as well, and this is again on a single snapshot basis, is the notion of an end map. Uh, and again, you can write these, there's a, uh, you can query this through the Python APIs and you can write some rules around it. Uh, but here, I what I have is a quick view of what all the protocols and ports are open for any given endpoint, any given destination in the network. So for some VLANs behind Leaf 1, I have HTTP and HTTPS open along with my ACMP ports. And I, as I go through this sort of table, you know, it's a nice summarized table view for me. I see that only two Leafs are running web services and that are accessible from outside my network. Nobody else has any services that are oh, running that are accessible outside my network. I'm just allowing basic ping uh, ICMP access. And if that's not my policy, I can now go back and make that change. All right, so let's go back and look at our new third snapshot real quick. And we can look at its policy page. And now everything's passed. So we can see very quickly that, you know, this latest snapshot, everything passed. The snapshot before it, I had a couple of failures and snapshot before that, which is my running network, everything is clear and, uh, and ready to go. And again, the UI is a great way to visualize this. I can also get access to that information through my GitLab uh, interface. So if I was to click on, this is my GitLab repo, I've got this CI job. If I click on that, I'm gonna get the output of my console here. And so this is just showing me the evaluation that's happened, what tests were run, which passed, which failed. In this case, everything passed. Uh, so for those of you that are familiar with some of these CI environments, this is sort of uh, a common thing you would see if you're using something like PyTest as an execution framework. Uh, and in our case, we're actually building our CI pipeline using PyTest and Ansible. Uh, and so before I sort of move to the, the next example, just wanted to show you guys a little bit about sort of how you write these policies. And so this is a set of policies that we built in Python. Uh, using PyTest, which is a common uh, test execution framework. And you can see it with a little bit of Python skills, it's pretty easy to create policies that are relevant for your network. So some of them are already built in. So uh, this Batfish assertion of no unestablished BGP session, that's a policy that exists in uh, Batfish itself. So you can just invoke it using the Python SDK like that. But you know there wasn't a native built-in policy saying no IBGP sessions. So I wrote a little bit of code to create that, right? And that was simple because I could query the Batfish data model for all my configured BGP sessions. I was looking for ones that are IBGP because Batfish is automatically gonna tell me if it's IBGP or IBGP. And I'm just making a simple assertion around the length of that, making sure it's zero. Similarly, forwarding loops, I've got a built-in assertion. So you just invoke that. Uh, unique ASNs, I had to write some code to build that myself. But again, it's pretty simple with just a little bit of Python uh, and then we're always adding to the native assertion. So, you know, you'll see over time, a lot of these tests will sort of this uh, little bit of Python code will get replaced by a simple assertion call. Uh, so pretty straightforward. Again, a pretty common way that you, people build tests in the CI environment today. You have that same facility uh, with Batfish to do that. 
So let me show you the second uh, example I wanted to uh, I built. And this is a scenario where I want to add some application into the network. So uh, think of it as I have an application team that is going to you know, launch a service. Uh, they've done all their work and now they've decided, okay, this is going to be launched in the network. And they say, hey, you know, help me understand what it takes to change the network to get the service launched. And you say, okay, give me some basic information about your application. So they're going to request the service and saying, okay, it needs to be uh, externally accessible. Uh, they've decided they want to host it on this IP subnet. Uh, uh, they don't. Well, they want everybody to get access to it. It's a TCP-based service. It's SSL, so it's four four three. And then, you know, I'm going to give it a change ticket ID. You know, just to simulate that. You know, this request can be tied to a service now ticket. Uh, so you could sort of uh, upload information about the test run back into that if you have this information. So my workflow asks for a ticket ID, yeah. and now I'm off and running. So again, similarly. What this playbook does is just sort of creates the underlying YAML files that I need for the rest of my pipeline to get kicked off so that configs are generated. And as soon as they're generated, they're sent to Batfish. So, you know, in this example, what I'm trying to do is I want to understand what is the right change to enable this service. But then I also want to make sure that this change wouldn't violate any rules. Uh, and so if there are any policy violations, what I would do is I'd go back to the application team and say, hey, you know what? Uh, you need to make these changes to your application. Either, either run it in a different location, or maybe you have to pick a different port, uh, uh, whatever that might be based on the policy posture of the network. And then they will iterate on that. And then you finally arrive at the correct change. So let's take a look at that. Let's go back to the dashboard. So I've got this new snapshot, the fourth one, it's already been loaded. So if I go back to my policy page, I can see some of the policies are being run. So far, so good. Yeah. I can also, while we're waiting for the rest of the policies to go, I can come to this uh, compare tab. So here you can see I've made one config file change. Nothing's changed for routing. Nothing's changed on interface state, et cetera. Let me just figure out what that config change is. And I can see that really compactly here. I've added some changes. I made some changes to my firewall rules. Uh, I have added some new applications, some new address groups. And that has caught, triggered a change in reachability. And I can sort of see what that is right here while I'm waiting for the policies to run. So, okay, I can see that I've got the change in reachability. So, from outside my network, I have some accessibility to this destination behind this leaf. I can see that's TCP and it's 443. So, okay, that was the proposed change. So the only thing that's changed is TCP 443 for one IP subnet. So at least that part is good. But now let's look at the policy posture. So I can see my policies have all executed and one of them's failed. And so when I look at what that failure is, I can see the failure is private subnets, new TCP reachability. So I can sort of dig into this and say, okay, so Batfish has found at least one flow that violates this policy. And if I wanted to just from here, I can sort of dig into this some more and say, okay, why is this flow being allowed? And so what this is going to do is this is going to give me a view of saying, show me exactly how that flow enters my network. And again, the UI gives me this nice visualization of the paths. Uh, you can query the APIs as well you know, to get the step-by-step -step information. So I can see that this flow is coming from the internet now and making it all the way to this leaf. And at any given point, I can sort of evaluate why. So here I can see, okay, in my firewall, I've got a filter. My filter is permitting it. Let me take a look at that, what that filter definition is and what that, why it's permitting it. And I can see that the filter definition, it's matching this new term I created or that I showed you earlier from my outside to inside zone policy. Uh, and so now armed with this information, I know that I need to go to the application team and tell them, hey, you know what? This is not the right subnet to launch your service in. You need to pick an external subnet. You picked a private subnet uh, and then have them move it. And then they would re repeat the process until they got to a change that didn't violate any of my policies. But again, let's say you didn't have a lot of these policies up and running. Uh, the compare view gives you a nice view of a way of understanding what changed. Uh, so I can go into my reachability view. 
again, I can look at this and then I can actually now do a differential check. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna show me what we call sort of a differential trace route where it's gonna show me what the flow path is in my current snapshot and what it was in the original one. So here, we just sort of minimize these. So I can see in my current snapshot, the flow succeeds. It gets from the internet all the way to a resource behind the leaf and I can, and then my existing snapshot, my reference snapshot, it goes to the firewall and it gets denied there. And I can click on the firewall and say, okay, show me why. So in this case, routing is permitting it. So there is a route for it. So it's not that. I can go to the filter. I see that it's denied. And again, I can see what the filter result was in the reference snapshot. And this is going to show me that, hey, it matched my explicit default deny at the end. So again, it gives me information about why uh, this change happened, what was causing the change, what config attributes were causing that change. And then lastly, you know, again, let's say you are just trying to cover all your bases, I can do something similar. I can go back and run Nmap on this new snapshot on my latest snapshot, and that should expose that as well and show me, hey, look at this. I've got this lone HTTPS 443 hanging out on leaf 10 uh, while nobody else is there. So. Uh, the reality is what they probably should have done is just launched it in this public subnet over here rather than creating a new one. So lots of different ways for you to get information from the Vatfish data model. Uh, again, this is I'm showing you this stuff through our enterprise UI, but all this is accessible through the Python uh, APIs as well. And with the express goal of giving you information to determine, is this change safe or not? And if it's not safe, why is it not safe? Uh, and gives you an indication on how you can go remedy that. What is the right fix for that? All right. So that's what I had sort of prepared for you for sort of the, the product demo. Let me just bring up my slides again. Got a couple of things I wanted to share with you guys. Uh, I get this question a lot, uh, which is what is the difference between what is in the open source Batfish and what is in the enterprise offering? Uh, best way to describe it is so the enterprise offering builds on top of the open source. And so what's included in open source is all of the multi-vendor device support. So, you know, any all of the device config parsers, all the device data models around uh, routing, forwarding, et cetera, that's all open source. Uh, the Python SDK, so those APIs are uh, part of the open source. And then the query engine, so the ability to interact with the Batfish data models and extract information, that's all open source. Uh, that's been our model from the beginning, and that's going to continue to be the way we we develop. Any new platform that we add, we'll add it into open source to make sure you can take advantage of it. And the enterprise is going to just sort of layer add value added functionality on top of it. So we build things like network analyzers. So I didn't show you in this demo, but uh, we have advanced analytics and heuristics that can automatically tell you if the network change is good or bad uh, based on what your current configuration state is. Uh, the GUI, the graphical user interface, you saw that. Third-party integration, so you know we've got native integrations in the enterprise offering with tools like SolarWinds NCM, with ServiceNow, and we're continuing to add to that. And then you also get role-based access control with SSO and SAML, so if you need to restrict who can do what, uh, and then obviously support. So that's sort of the core difference between the open source uh, and the enterprise offering. Uh, not going to go through these. Lastly, you'll see these in the slides, and I, Hank's got them in uh, in the additional links documentation as well. There's a lot of material out there on how you can use Batfish. Uh, the good starting point is the Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, they are designed around very specific things that Batfish can do for you, and with real code examples and sort of built-in network examples that we created that you can use. So it's a nice way to sort of just get started to play around with the APIs and understand what it can do. Uh, and then sort of move on from using our example networks to then evaluating yours. There's a lot of video tutorials as well. Uh, documentation, you know, please take a look at that. And if there's, you know, things aren't clear, let us know. File doc bugs will continue to improve it. And then we have an open source Slack channel. Uh, we're very active there. It's a pretty large community. If it's not us, somebody else in the community can help you. So we encourage you to join that and ask questions. You know, ask us, you know, try to use Batfish come to us saying, hey, I'm trying to do X, Y, Z, uh, we'll help you out. Uh, last thing I wanted to leave you with, you know, part of our enterprise offering is we've 
uh, been doing a lot of work around hybrid cloud. And so we've just launched a free trial for Batfish Enterprise for AWS. Uh, it's very easy. The sign up link's right there. You can go sign up for it. We'll generate a license key and give you instructions on how to get started. Uh, runs in your AWS infrastructure and all of your configs and information stays with you. Uh, we don't see any of that. And then there's a few demo videos tied to that AWS uh, trial uh, at that link there. So please take a look. And you know, as you have any other questions, uh, like I said, Slack channel is a great way to interact with us. Please join it. Uh, and we're here to help. With that, I'll sort of leave it. My last slide, you know, hopefully you've been able to see uh, how Batfish can help you understand the impact of a change before you make it. And so we're hoping that you can leverage Batfish on your journey to building more reliable and agile networks. Excellent, Samir, that was an awesome demo. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit. I, I've been collecting notes and questions that I had as we went through this. So I'll let you get yourself unshared and all the rest of that. We can dive into these. Awesome. Perfect. All right. So I want to I want to talk a bit about the demo because there was some lots of stuff you showed in there. And there was a question that came into the chat that I think is worth going through as well. So yeah. your first demo, you you added Leaf 90, and to do yeah. that, you ran an Ansible playbook. What did that playbook do? Did it does bat is Batfish generating network configuration for that? Or like what exactly did that playbook do? Because we're we're so used to generating network configs using some other framework, do it yourself, Python yeah. or Ansible or something else. Like where did that Ansible playbook like what did it do? Oh, uh, that's a that's a great question. So what that playbook so that playbook is not part of Batfish or the, sort of open source or enterprise. What I did was it was sort of trying to mimic a common workflow where I have a series of Jinja templates that define the sections of my various configs. And the playbook was just getting information to create the YAML variable file. So mm -hmm. in my Git repo, it was mostly just, you know, as someone that's had to like, you know, as I've iterated through that demo, editing YAML files, you know, in the UI of GitLab or GitHub, your formatting becomes the biggest thing, right? It's like the number of times I've messed up something uh, because I didn't format things correctly. Uh, I thought that, you know, a good workflow is, ask people for the information they need and then programmatically generate that YAML and then mm -hmm. marry that through a CI pipeline stage to generate the configs by adding the Jinja templates into it. So, Okay, so so if folks are familiar with creating network configuration templates using Ansible or something like that, you, you just did the same thing and it, exactly. it resulted in a new network configuration for that leaf that was then kind of processed by Batfish. Batfish didn't exactly. create configs, it's just reading them in. Exactly, yeah, Batfish, the way to think of it is Batfish is this service that's designed to run offline that doesn't talk to your network today so that you don't have to worry about yet another device polling your network, you don't have to worry about security and credentials for your network and that device. And you interact with it programmatically, so the CI pipeline, one stage was purely Ansible plus Python that generated the configs. Mm -hmm. And then there was an API call into Batfish saying, here's the new config, mm -hmm. do your analysis. And then Batfish then sends the results back. Okay, that makes sense. I, I wanna talk, you you went through, you used the GUI in the demo for enterprise mm -hmm. and then commented that all those things, everything that the that's in the GUI is available through the API piece that's there. If, if yep. folks are experimenting with Batfish open source, is it, what's, what's the, is it a CLI tool? Is it really just like Postman REST API calls and they're gonna get JSON blobs that describe like success? Like what is the experience and what do you get in the Batfish open source world? Great question. I think the typical experience in the Batfish open source world is most people end up using the Python SDK so that you don't have to worry about requests and JSON formatting. It's like, you know, think of it underneath, under the covers, it's a series of REST calls, but the mm -hmm. Python uh, APIs give you a function wrapper to call. So. You know, I can run a query that says, you know, I can query Batfish for the routing table and I don't have to worry about what the JSON format is. I can just say, you know, call the function call that's bfq.route table, you know, that routes and tell it the node and the verf and it's just gonna return that in structured output to me. Uh, you So the data that comes back, there's two formats that you can retrieve it in. One is JSON. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll get a JSON, sort of a table schema in JSON. Or what most people prefer to do is you get a pandas data frame back. Uh, just because it makes it easy to manipulate the data. So, you know, rather than sort of creating an, our own sort of table schema, we sort of leverage, you know, uh, pan, the Pandas framework, which is a very common data science library. Okay. So you can uh, have Batfish, have the Python function return all that information in uh, Pandas format. 
So the primary, it, just to, to make sure I got that right. So if in the Batfish open source world, the primary mechanism for interacting with Batfish is through a, the Python libraries. Yeah, that that is the, the, the primary goal, the mechanism. So there is an Ansible role as well. So for, uh, but the, the Python API gives you the most surface area in terms of sure. interacting. The Ansible role is the subset of the Python functionality today. Okay. But as more people use it, we're going to continue to sort of build out the Ansible role as well. Gotcha. So that I think that dovetails into another question that I had. So what would you say, I'm a network engineer. Let's say I'm, I'm traditionally a network engineer. I'm getting involved in network automation. I, I like the NetDevOps stuff that's in there. And, and I'm interested in Batfish. What what skills do I need before I can be comfortable working with Batfish? Do I need to be rock solid on Python? Like, what what do I? What are the prerequisites to be to be valuable for Batfish I, working? I, uh, I think the prerequisites is that you have to have some. I would say uh, beginners sort of Python knowledge, uh, just so the understanding. Okay, this Python function calls. How do you import libraries? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you manipulate data that comes back to you? Uh, so if you have some basic Python skills, you can get started with Batfish uh, to start querying the data model, you know. And obviously, you know, as you know, it's like there's a different skill level for using the tool versus sort of building the automation platform around it. So if you want to build the automation platform, I think that that you need much higher sort of Python skills than if you just want to start taking advantage of the tool uh, in that sort of interactive way, saying, you know, I want to look at a change. You know what? I don't. I'm not going to build this pipeline, but I want to find a way to validate some change I want to make with a little bit of Python skills. So rudimentary Python skills, you can get take advantage of uh, Batfish and sort of understand what's going on. Okay. Now, say I've got that. I've got some basic Python skills. I'm interested in Batfish. What do you recommend are the first three tests that an engineer should try to tackle for an environment? I have to imagine there's like a, a, a common entry point for folks getting started. Uh, I think the the most the first common thing is you know. I think everybody has uh, some written down rules around common attributes, right? NTP server, syslog servers, MTU. Uh, that's a great way to get started in terms of writing a test uh, mm -hmm. because you know it's purely querying the Batfish data model for some config attribute and making sure it meets some value that you know it should. And so that's a pretty easy test to write. So that sort of would be the, the first one to write. Uh, I think the second one would then be writing a test around reachability. So don't worry about the nuances of what routes are where. Uh, just focus on, you know, this flow should succeed, right? So it's like if I know that everybody from outside my network should be able to reach my website, so I know what which endpoints that website is hosted on. I understand. I know I need port eighty and four four three. You can write a very simple policy around that. So and, and because it's just you're looking for pass fail, right? So sure. the, the, you want to get started with things that. You're not manipulating any of the data. You're saying, I know this should be true, and I have a Batfish query that says, is this true, is this false? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's the best way that probably to get started in building your pipe policy pipeline. OK. Related to is kind of piggybacking off of that. So we give Batfish our network configurations for the pieces that are there. And okay. then you showed how Batfish can create a topology map that shows like how my spines and leaves and routers and firewalls are connected. Yep. How does Batfish pick that up just from configuration information? Do I have to embed like connectivity details into description strings? So it doesn't parse the description. So at the base level, what it's doing is it's using the IP subnets and saying, okay, these two interfaces are in the same subnet, therefore they must be connected. Okay. So if you have a network where you're not reusing IP addresses, that is all you need. And it'll just sort of, uh, it'll give you an accurate layer three topology. If you are doing subnet reuse, right? So you're putting in two data centers and each data center uses the same IP space. Mm -hmm. Then what you need to do is you have to provide some type of wiring diagram. Okay. And so uh, there in the open source world, there's a sort of well-defined JSON format that you can provide uh, as, along with your config input. And you can generate that by parsing LLDP or CDP data. And then in the enterprise offering, we've built in some uh, mm, some parsers for LDP and CDP data. So along with your configs, if you gave us that LDP data, we'll automatically parse that and build sort of the layer one wiring diagram. Mm -hmm. But in a pure layer three network with no IP reuse, you don't have to provide anything. But if you have sort of these islands of layer two, like you know, a couple layers of uh, levels of layer two aggregation with no IP interfaces, or you have IP reuse, then that topology diagram is necessary so that it can figure out who's talking to whom. Okay. 
Now on that, so the tests and the demos you talked through and a lot of the examples related in the layer three world, BGP sessions, routing sessions, access control lists. What about folks that still have quite a bit of layer two elements in their environment, campus networks that are heavily layer two and haven't moved to layer three to the edge or even data centers that still are very right. layer two, that's common. Is there a good use case there? Or are those still features that, that need to be fleshed out? For the layer two case, there's definitely a lot more feature work that needs to be fleshed out. So we haven't taken on the work around sort of understanding spanning tree and sort of sure. building a spanning tree model to understand what ports are blocking. And, you know, we don't do a lot of sort of what is the Mac forwarding table is going to look like. Uh, so the work we've done on layer two has mostly been around overlay. So, you know, mm -hmm. Batfish understands VXLAN and EVPN, uh, for instance. And so, but yeah, the, the current incarnation focuses very heavily on layer three networks. Okay. Uh, so data center leaf spines, but you know, over time, you know, we'll we'll either get there where we'll add the layer two support based on sort of demand from the community and from customers, or you know, peop most people have moved off of layer two uh, extensively, and that sort of problem will solve itself. Sure. So we've, we're coming close on at a time. There's two more questions that came in from the audience that I wanted to try to tackle, and then we'll close down. The okay. first one is. So let's say I've got two routers or two devices that should have very similar configurations, like the, maybe it's active standby or they just mm -hmm. are similar purposes. Can Batfish kind of look at those and, and tell you whether like how similar the configs are or, or pieces like that? Is that a, an interesting use case or a valid use case? Uh, it's definitely a valid use case because we see, you know, it, it ends up being a relatively common problem, right? Like the backup path is not 100% accurately configured as the primary path. And then mm -hmm. when failover happens, bad things happen. So uh, so in the open source world, you can easily sort of compare attributes. So you can get the device config and the routing table for the primary and the backup, and you can sort of do that comparison. In the enterprise offering, we've built in some analyzers. So we know, hey, <coughs> these are paired. Therefore, paired devices should have certain attributes that are common. Okay. Uh, and so we automatically do that. So that's part of that network analyzer a uh, bit that I was talking about as part of the enterprise offering. But again, you could write the code to do similar things using uh, the open source bits as well. Okay. And then the last one is where does, does Batfish look at kind of um, IP, uh, IPS, IDS types of pieces in there? Or is it kind of not delved into those spaces? It doesn't dive into sort of IDS, IPS. So the way that we think of it is like it operates every, all the way up to the layer four header. So Mm -hmm. Firewalls that do anything that are stateful, that's fine. Uh, but if uh, right now we don't do sort of DPI based uh, application recognition, right? So if you had a rule that says deny facebook.com uh, in some uh, DPI based stateful firewall, then that would not be something that we should understand today. Uh, but if you had it strictly sort of based on IP addresses and ports, uh, it understands that and it can process that. All right. There was a last minute question that I came in that I think is worth at least putting out there. Yeah. Multicast support. Anything in multicast with Batfish yet? It, uh, I had two people come in, like right at the top <laughs> of that question. Uh, it's amazing. Like the, the last week or so, I've been getting a lot of multicast questions. So it must be some of the financials are starting mm -hmm. to uh, join our open source and ask about it. So right now, we don't do anything for multicast. There's some basic parsing and extraction, uh, but we haven't built anything around sort of the multicast control plane or data plane. Uh, okay, but you know, it's we understand what it takes to do it. It's just more of is there enough demand for mm -hmm. us to sort of do that work first versus sort of adding some other platforms or doing some other work. Uh, so, and I think that's common with a lot of open source programs and even commercial yeah. programs is that features like multicast and, and layer two, like those get driven based on your users and what the demand are. And if you're starting exactly, to it, I imagine they'll be prioritized more, and, and eventually we'll see those. Awesome, absolutely. Great. Well, we are we are definitely at the end. I want to thank you so much. Um, every time I talk to you, I learn a little bit more about Batfish and understand it. There, there was a few questions we didn't get to. At some point, I may need to kind of have you explain the magic of the mathematical models. It still seems like this black magic bit that yeah. that just has me feeling like <laughs> Harry Potter in the network. Um, but this was a really good kind of introduction. I love the demonstration. I'm, I'm itching to get my hands on some of those pieces that are there. So thank awesome. you. Any final words before I close this down? No, I mean, I, I'm thanks for the invite. You know, this has been great. I'm glad I was able to join and share what we're doing and talk about Batfish. And please, you know, everybody, yeah, give it a whirl. Try the open source. It's very easy to get started. We're, you know, we've really tried to put out a lot of code examples and a lot of how-to guides to help you get started and play with it. And, you know, 
we're, we're excited to see what sort of you can build in the network automation space using Batfish. And you know, uh, let's go from there. Wonderful. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start sharing here so we can kind of finish this up and get ready for next week. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again to Samir for joining us for today's session. Um, we had a, an excellent kind of talk through what Batfish and network validation is. And as a reminder, if you're looking for the webinar resources, documentation, some code examples, um, we don't have a specific DevNet sandbox on Batfish, but if you want to pull configs and pieces that are there, we do have some examples where you can grab some interesting platforms that are supported. So please take a look at those. Now, I always like to give a code exchange challenge. And this one kind of gave me an interesting one to go through because this is probably a new technology for a lot of us. But I say, you know, let's all go fishing. Let's write a network validation test using Batfish. Um, I put out an example here, of verify access control list. But frankly, I like some of Samir's suggestions of just validating key elements of the configuration, NTP settings, um, peering information. So take a look at the Jupyter Notebooks, write some demonstrations, and let's see what we can do with Batfish to kind of do some better um, network validation of our environments. Now, if you want more on NetDevOps in general, be sure to check out all the resources we have on DevNet. So developer.cisco.com slash NetDevOps, or for season one, two, and continuing to register for season three, NetDevOps slash live. We have our blogs, we have video series. There's so many great things that you can tackle to learn more about network automation and net DevOps that are out there. And then do please join us next week. If you haven't registered yet, it's gonna be a special one. Kevin Corbin from HashiCorp is joining, but Kevin's not a new person to Net DevOps Live. He was uh, formerly with Cisco. And if you go back into season one and season two, you'll see episodes with Kevin uh, diving deep into network automation. And I'm eager to hear what he brings um, along now that he's with HashiCorp and talking about kind of that cloud operating model and fitting that into the network engineer world. I'm really looking forward to ne next week's episode. I hope you all join me there as well. And then if you do have more questions, please stay in touch. You can find me at hapresto at cisco.com at email or WebEx Teams. And then of course, HF Preston on Twitter. And please do follow Cisco DevNet on all the social medias. Uh, we're on Twitter, Facebook, GitHub, Instagram. Heck, they might even be Snapchatting these days. Please keep up with us. It's the best way to know the latest on programmability from everything that's out there. And with that, thank you all so much for joining us for another episode. And we will see you again next week. Take care, everybody.